All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to this Golden Key Academy live webinar. Uh, my name is Winnie. I'm the Marketing and Partnerships Officer for Golden Key International Honor Society. Today we're presenting Finding Balance with Technology in Our Always On Culture, presented by our wonderful speaker, Lee Chantel. Uh, now, let me tell you a little bit about Lee Chantel. So she's passionate about cyber psychology, digital well-being, and digital communication, particularly mindful and conscious use of technology and forming digital boundaries. She graduated with a Bachelor of Psychology First Class Honors in 2020, and she's starting her PhD actually this month. So Lee Chantel um, is a digital wellness educator, and she aims to be a lecturer in cyber psychology. Her background is as a speaker and consultant for online marketing, advertising, content creation, and social media. She's also a vegan veteran known for helping bring awareness of veganism into the mainstream with her organizational and leadership skills. Now, just some quick notes for today's webinar. Your mics and cameras are off. If you have any questions for Lee Chantel, just put them into the Q&A box or chat box. There's a 15 minute Q&A session at the end where she will be answering all, the, all of your questions. Um, all right, welcome, uh, Lee Chantel. Now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Winnie. Can you hear me? And thank you, Golden Key. Yes. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining me today. And as Winnie mentioned, we're going to be talking about finding balance when we're always on technology. So let's start. There we go. So the agenda today is we're going to cover a lot about technology and how technology influences certain things. For example, I'm going to talk about news, health and democracy. And then we're going to talk a bit about cyber psychology, why I like it, how we use technology at the moment, digital wellness and digital equilibrium. Then I'm going to give you some tips and tricks throughout to achieve this digital equilibrium. So we're all using technology, we're all using digital devices, and we're working from home and studying from home now. And so, for example, I'm delivering this presentation to you via the interwebs. But sometimes some of these things that we do on technology come at the expense of other important aspects in our lives. And we need greater awareness of how technology works and why we think feel and behave in certain ways and how to balance our technology use. So we just wanted to cover the news area at the moment and just how technology can influence it. So fake news spreads, spreads six times faster than accurate news on Twitter and falsehoods are more likely to be retweeted. And this links to the next tip that when um, President Trump and his allies were suspended from social media sites, the misinformation about election fraud went down 73%. Now, this is a loss, isn't it? And it just shows you how much power technology companies, in particular social media companies, have with what information is spread and what information is not. And then we move on to health and in particular COVID because this is affecting the whole of the world at the moment. Um, social media is unregulated, unlike TV and magazines and newspapers. And because of this unregulation, it allows the amplification of any sort of information. So it can be conflicting and it can be misinformation or disinformation. And this happens because there's algorithms that are created and this content that is online is designed to amplify your attention. And this is particularly prevalent on YouTube and Facebook. And I'm sure you've heard of the term conspiracy theory or conspiracy beliefs. And that comes from a term called conspiracism, which means that you believe that something has been orchestrated by someone who's more powerful or malevolent than you. And this, these conspiracy beliefs 
they're frequently used to explain COVID, particularly online. And because of this, it's fueling protests, damage and violence. And a great example of how this brings the online space into the um, in-person space is the coup that we saw at Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. And because COVID, um, because of these sort of aspects, the conspiracy beliefs are seen as a global public health threat because this inhibits health protective behaviours like washing your hands, wearing masks, staying inside when you need to. One of the things I'm particularly interested about is how um, technology can change people's interests and change how we think and act in certain ways, and in particular democracy in the US and the UK has been one of those things that's gained a lot of attention. Um, I hope a lot of you are, are aware of Cambridge Analytica, a group that used to take um, information from a Facebook app all about personality profiles. And they took this information and they worked out your personality traits, both based on the ocean idea, which included openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So from this, they worked out that particular traits of, that people had particularly resonated or particularly reacted with certain advertisements. So for example, if someone was high on openness, the adverts at Cambridge Analytica would send to those people were related to um, supporting national security as a positive change to the world. Those people high on conscientiousness were told about national security and those that were high on extroversion were focused with the concept and importance of leadership. Agreeableness, people high on that also were taught about national security. And the one that I find the most interesting is neuroticism. And Cambridge Analytica plays to these anxieties that people have. And they were targeted with advertisements that emphasized the growing international risks and a need for strong, stable leaders in the US. Now, you might think these tactics are maybe, you know, a bit um, ethically ambiguous, but they're now standard political marketing tactics and they're used to sway undecided voters and anxious voters. And there's no US laws to prohibit these practices. So they're just three examples of why I'm really interested in cyber psychology. And if you've never heard of the term, it's a new-ish area that is grounded in behavioral science and human computer research. And it combines two of my favorite things. So you've got technology and you've got cyber as psychology, which combines why we behave, think, and feel in certain ways, plus how these things can be influenced. And it's multidisciplinary, so it's not just in the psychological area or in the technology area. And you might have heard some of the areas of research, such as cyberbullying or cybersecurity. And an example for me with my research interests is that I did my honours last year on humanoid social robots and how they interact with preschoolers versus humans. And my PhD this year is focusing on behavioural change and technology acceptance in regards to autonomous vehicles and blockchain technologies. And so I just thought I'd go over a few of the stats related to our technology use. And this always freaks out a few people, actually. Um, so, yeah, let's go through what the average smartphone owner does per day. They will unlock their phone 150 times, touch their phone over 2,000 times, and spend almost three hours on their phone a day. And most people in their lifespan will spend almost five and a half years on social media. 58% of smartphone users cannot go for one hour without checking their phone and 67% compulsively check their smartphone for messages, alerts, or calls, even without a prompt. And once you pick up your phone, you have a 50% chance of picking it up again within the next three minutes. So if you have poor digital boundaries, you can turn a device from a tool into a compulsion. And I really love this quote. 
what it means to live well, have a fair and functional society, to meaningfully communicate and relate to others are now mediated through technology. And one of the effects of this is people's autonomy, their ability to control their own time and space, to think and to understand, and all of this is under a great deal of pressure. However, this overwhelm and more people educating themselves about technology is leading to more people wanting technology balance in their life. So 63% of consumers try to limit their phone usage and 43% of workers turn off their phones to cope with distraction. And the term digital wellness and the lifestyle and the ideas it encompasses is increasing in popularity. And 60% of HR officers are planning to increase support for wellbeing and mental health this year. If you've not heard of the term digital wellness, it means it's an optimal state of health, personal fulfillment and social satisfaction that everyone using technology should be able to achieve. And this is no longer a luxury in the workplace. It's essential for your organisation to perform at its best. If you're interested in learning more about some of the, the topics I'm covering today, um, the Digital Wellness Institute runs a 10 week certification program. You can use my code for that and it starts in May, the next one. And now we go over to digital equilibrium. And this is a concept that I've created and a model I've created as well. And um, it's only new, so I'm open to constructive feedback about it. So um, let me know if you have any thoughts about it after, after the presentation and the Q and A's. But digital equilibrium is all about creating lifelong healthy digital habits to thrive online and beyond. And there's six elements which you can see on the image and they all need to be understood and in balance. And the aim is to identify imbalance, stressors, reactive, addictive and unconscious behaviours. And through this identification, you will be able to manage and change negative and harmful digital behaviours into positive and healthy digital habits with balance. So when we go through this model now and all the elements from it, I want you to think about ways that maybe you can improve what you're doing with your digital devices and your technology consumption at the moment. And some of the aspects that I use are like a pause, consider, decide model and reflections. And I also love cost benefit analysis. So we're just going to get into those now. So first, let's start with digital literacy. And this is simply all about understanding how technology works. So with, do you know where to change your privacy settings? Do you know about your data security? Do you know what's being shared about you? Do you know what persuasive design means and how it influences the things that you do online? Could you tell if something was true versus something that has been created primarily to spread mis or disinformation? Did you know that algorithms are designed to keep us consuming content online? And this leads to echo chambers that are also known as filter bubbles. And this is where you only see and interact with content that you already agree with. This creates polarization where people with strong differing views are divided and those with moderate views are silenced. Exploitative technologies have proliferated due to the lack of collective understanding about how platforms work and how they impact us. Unintended consequences take the form of mental health, democracy and discrimination issues. And um, if you've seen the Social Dilemma documentary, this is a really good way to learn more about this information. And Tristan Harris, who's from the Centre for Humane Technology, he talks about social media that was promoted to us as a tool originally, but it's not anymore because a tool just sits there and you just have to choose when you want to interact with it. But now social media has become addiction and manipulation based technology and it's using your psychology against you. 
And here's an image that I created based on an article in The Verge that was about how to fight lies, tricks and chaos online. And this is encouraging you to just think more. It's critical thinking and it's applying critical thinking online. So saying things when you need to maybe you be worried or stop a bit more is when you see something online that you have a strong emotional reaction to that you immediately want to amp amplify the story. You need to look deeper, work out what the context is, who is giving the information, and if they're saying it's actually an outrage, is that really true? Are people really upset? And how are other outlets presenting the story? Then you need to check out the information, check out the link, and this is like verif verifying stuff. Searching for quotes, identify the videos and photos because a lot of them are used in other ways, in incorrect ways online. How time sensitive is it? And is it just a new story? Is it just an old story that's been rehashed as a new topic? And then you want to weigh up the evidence. So what's getting left out? What's being changed? What happens if it's wrong or you are wrong with your beliefs? And why should you share this story online? This might be something you might want to take a screenshot of, but I'm also going to be sharing my slides on SlideShare later. So you'll be able to check that out there as well. And I also consider, um, I would also consider and suggest that you write down some notes in regards to some reflections that I'm going to ask you to do and have a think about these and do these later on. So in regards to digital literacy, I want you to think about what problems have you seen due to people not understanding technology? Do you think your digital usage is a tool or a compulsion? Do you think it's important for everyone to see the same set of facts? And for the pause, consider, decide idea, I want you, the next time something upsets you online, I want you to pause. And I want you to consider, is this something if this is something that you have a strong emotional reaction to, then why are you having that reaction? And then hopefully you'll come to a decision along the lines of, you know, I'm not going to even bother interacting with this because there'll be another outrage tomorrow. I need to do other things. I'm going to ignore it, get on with my day. And as I mentioned before, I'd like you to watch The Social Dilemma to read more, to learn more about that. And you can read their discussion and action guide as well. Then we'll move on to worthwhile communication. And this is all about exchange of relevant and quality information. And this is using technology to facilitate and not replace human interactions. Did you know that non-verbal cues, behaviors and body language serve as social value signals and these help us work out how others value us. And that then translates into how we feel about ourselves. And this is really hard to achieve online, but we are adaptable. So we can update how we interact based on intentions, such as what we want to achieve with the goal of the interaction and your individual style and someone else's individual style. And I'd like you to think about how much influence people have when they have a lot of followers or a lot of reach, because there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. So the more followers someone has, it doesn't mean they're more correct or they're more knowledgeable. It just means that the ideas that they say can be spread a lot faster and to a lot more people. And I'd like you to reflect and ask yourself, how often do you connect with your friends and family outside of liking their posts? Do you text, do you call, do you send audio messages? And how do you prefer to communicate with your friends and family? And what about how they prefer? And how often do you have conversations with family and friends when your phone is out of reach and you are 100% present? That's a hard one. <laughs> and so let's think about the pause, consider, decide aspects. So before you share another link about the latest news report, I want you to pause. And I want you to consider, are you actually offering anything new to the conversation? 
And then hopefully you'll make a decision along the lines of, look, I'm not really adding anything more to the conversation. So I'm not going to share the article online, but I'll just share it with a couple of my friends so we can have a little bit of a back and forth about it. And I'd like you to action in the next week or so to take the time to organize to speak with your top three friends, whether that's in person, on Skype or Zoom or on the phone. Then we move on to meaningful interactions and beneficial relationships. And meaningful interactions are where you have mutual influences. And if you focus on honest, positive people who bring you joy, this is a really great first step. Beneficial relationships are connection and support, and they are comprised of a pattern of quality interactions. And the link between these two is that meaningful interactions can lead to beneficial relationships when expectations between individuals are created. Remote workers are 3.2 times more likely to be productive if they feel satisfied with their social connectivity. And did you know that infinite choice is an issue that leads to overwhelm? And the next bit, when I talk about the two different types of people in the world, maybe have a think about how you connect with new people. And this could be like on dating apps or on meetups or something like that. So the two different types of people are maximizers or satisficers. And a maximizer is someone who exhaustively seeks for the best always, always compares their decisions with other people, spends more time and energy on decisions. And whenever they decide something, they're always unhappier with the outcome. If you're this type of person, I would suggest that you try to be more like a satisficer where you accept good enough, you don't obsess over what other people think. You can move on after you've made a decision and you're much happier with an outcome. So I'd like you to reflect and ask yourself a few things. How often do you engage in positive and active interactions online that encourage meaningful conversations? And when you're interacting with someone new, when does the interaction become a relationship? Do you want meaningful relationships but get caught up in the superficial aspects of online engagement? And if so, how could you change this? And I'd like to give an example for this pause, consider, decide. And this is something that I did when I was using the dating app Bumble recently. So I was getting a lot of potential matches on Bumble and I had to pause. I had to consider, do I really need any more matches or should I just focus on the ones I've already been communicating quite a lot with? So I ended up deciding first that I would create a digital um, barrier or a digital boundary, which was that I would turn off my location settings so that um, when, I turned, when I pulled up the app, I initially didn't get all these options and distractions with match potentials. And then I made a concerted effort to catch up in person with people I was chatting with. So I'd like you to focus on interacting mindfully online, aiming to connect meaningfully with people and trying not to get caught up in superficial interactions and conversations. And all of this stuff is really hard at the beginning, but the more you do it, the easier it is and the better you become at it. And then let's move on to healthy boundaries and self-care. So you need to be able to understand what you need to be able to express it and to ask for whatever you ex expect and your boundaries as well. And this encompasses all aspects of yourself from your mind, your body, your social and spiritual. And it also includes physical as well as online environments. And some easy aspects of self-care are to eat healthful food, quality food, get proper sleep, encourage movement, breaks and exercise, and have time outside in, in nature. Gratitude is also, also really important. And did you know that almost 60% of people experience screen-related aches and pains causing physical drain and less productivity? 
but still two thirds of these people say that they turn their phone on first thing in the morning. Higher social media use is correlated with self-reported declines in mental and physical health and life satisfaction. But like I mentioned before, nature is an antidote to overwhelm, attention fatigue, and it can enhance cognitive performance. And it's free. So I want you to reflect and ask yourself, what boundaries do you have for your technology use? How much physical and digital clutter do you have now and how can you change it? How often do you take breaks away from your screen? And do you notice a link between your use of technology and how you feel? And then I want you to pause, consider, decide about this. So when you're at your desk for a long time, you know, a lot of us working from home or studying from home, I want you to pause. And I want you to consider, how could I use this moment to move a muscle and change a feeling? And hopefully you'll make a decision along the lines of, I'm going to take a short break to focus on movement. And you can do lots of different things. Some stretches, walk around when you're having some tea or coffee, go for a walk around the block, do some push-ups, catch up with a friend. And um, to action going forward is for you to clean up your emails, desktop images, and your desk to factor in time for movement and downtime away from your screen. And let's move on to productivity. And productivity pretty much is all about efficiency. And this is about time and energy management, which is particularly important when you work from home. Emphasize focus and goals. Did you know that our always on culture leads to distractions in shallow work rather than deep work? And since COVID, people looking online um, for how to get your brain to focus has increased by 300%. And this unfocused time online, it fuels feelings of anxiety and increases the risk of depression. And over two thirds of employees experience burnouts from working from home with 55% checking their emails after 11 p.m. But at the top, it's saying that 50% of work interruptions are self-inflicted. So we can change it. So I'd like you to reflect and ask yourself, how often are you distraction free when you're working? How many of your notifications need to be turned on? And do you have clear boundaries for work and off work? And I want you to pause, consider and decide about this. So when you're about to check your phone due to a notification, I want you to pause. And I want you to consider, do I actually need to be checking my phone right now? And think about the stat that we found out before, that if you check your phone right now, not only are you being distracted in the moment, but in three minutes time, 50% of people are going to need to check their phone again. So hopefully you can decide that, no, I'm not gonna check my phone. I'm going to focus on the work at hand and I'll check later on my next break. So to action would be to set some time aside this week to turn off all notifications on your phone from things other than people. So for example, on my phone, I only have notifications for calls, for iMessages, for Signal and for WhatsApp. That's it. And then the last one is mindful and conscious decision-making. So this is where you choose where your, where your attention is directed to. And this is all about less reactive responses where you use intentional technology instead of passively using technology. And did you know that rational and emotional systems control human decision-making outcomes? And these have different associations in your brain. Mindfulness is conscious perception of the present when being open, receptive, and non-judgmental. 
So an intentional approach, it helps us holistically to think about the how, the when, the where, and the why we interact with technology. And when you understand these concepts, you can then work out the effects of your choices, and this allows for better decision making. And I'd like you to reflect and ask yourself, do your values align with how you are spending your time online? Do you think that you make rational or emotional decisions when it comes to your digital device use? And think about the um, uh, abbreviation HALT. What are some times when you have felt hungry, angry, lonely or tired? And how has your technology use been affected? And then I want you to pause and consider, decide about this. So when you're about to interact with the outrage of the day, I want you to pause and consider why are you feeling this way now? And remember HALT. And hopefully you can make a decision along the lines of, you re recognize you're feeling angry and you understand when you're angry, you don't make the best decisions and you say things you regret. So therefore, instead of engaging in the outrage, you're just going to look at some cute animal videos online and then you're going to log off. And I'd like you to action the following. Think about your social media usage and whether or not your values line up with how you're spending your time online. Write down the changes you would like to make and remember that by writing down your goal, it makes you 40% more likely to achieve it. So here's some quick tips. I just want you to focus on one thing at a time and do that well, then move on to the next one so you're not totally overwhelmed. And the first thing would be to turn off all notifications and put your phone on silent. Keep your phone out of arm's reach when you are working and write down your daily, weekly, monthly goals to ensure that you achieve one small goal and one large goal each day. Declutter your workspace, which also helps with decluttering your mind. And focus on regular short breaks away from your desk and away from your screen. And you want to be focusing on the concept of move a muscle to change a feeling and spend more time in nature and with people who bring you joy. And the reason that this is important is because for those of us who rely on these platforms, we're unknowingly complicit in a devil's bargain where we trade our freedom for followers, our social cohesion for instant connection and the truth for what we want to hear. One of my favorite artists, Kay Tempest, they wrote this quote from one of their songs, is your life well lived or is your life well displayed? Which I think is another really good reflection. And also remember that the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. So while you're passively scrolling through you know, social media, what are you missing out on? Are you missing out on those connections with people, the deeper conversations and getting to know yourself more? Like work out the things that are important to you and whether or not you need to be online as much as you are. So in summary, what we did today was we went through um, cyber psychology, digital wellness and digital equilibrium. We worked out some actionable aspects to embody digital equilibrium based on those six elements. And I hope by leading by example, you can promote and empower others to make more conscious and mindful digital choices. And this leads to digital well-being and digital equilibrium. And I hope you'd like to find out more information about what I've spoken about before. I've told you a few books and some places to join. But I, one of the things is The Social Dilemma on Netflix. This is a really good introduction, especially to other people that maybe don't understand technology. And Tristan Harris and his team at, at the Center for Humane Technology are really awesome and do great work. You can check out their a podcast, Your Undivided Attention and their Ledger of Harms. Also check out Demos from the UK and Data Society from the US.
If you'd like to read a new book or two, here's some of my favorites about these topics I've covered today. Targeted and the one on the right are both specific to Cambridge Analytica and how they change democracy in the US and the UK with Brexit. Persuasive Technologies from BJ Fogg, and this is a really great book about how computers or technology change what we think and do. The Age of Surveillance Capitalism is a really, really well-researched book and in-depth read in why we have become the products now. And I hope you have gained a lot of information out of that. As I said before, I'll put the video up on YouTube after this and the slides will also be on SlideShare. You can have a look and follow me on Twitter and begrudgingly Facebook. Um, and there are my websites at the bottom, Epicenter Equilibrium. My Digital Equilibrium website will be launched very shortly. My Lee Chantel website and my VivaLaVegan.net website. So thank you for your attention and the time that you put into this today. And I look forward to your Q&A. Thank you, Lee. Thank you so much, Lee Chantel. The talk was very impressive. And thank you for the tips and tricks as well. Um, everyone, do you have any questions for Lee Chantel? Thank you, Eric. I'm glad you got something out of the topics. <laughs> <laughs> and I also find the uh, digital equilibrium model very interesting and very helpful. Oh, good. Thank you. I think we have a question coming through. So what do we search to find these slides on SlideShare? So um, I have my on SlideShare .net, is it, or .com. Um, if you just look up my name, Lee Chantel, it will come up with my channel. And um, I'll put that, I'll put the slides up there in the next few days. And then um, for maximizers, is there anything we can read on how to influence and inspire employees that are maximizers? I think with a lot of this stuff, it's leading by example, Charles. And um, in regards to employee, employees, that comes from the top down. So there's a lot of stuff in regards to digital wellness that you need to be having these clear boundaries and clear guides for everyone that's in a, in a office or in a company who they know this is what the people are doing at the top, therefore I need to do it as well. Um, so someone's asked me about um, that they're a third year psychology student and they're wondering how I got to where I am now, what pathways I took. So um, I, want, I want to be a lecturer in cyber psychology. So that was my goal going into psychology. And um, so I studied at Griffith University at the Gold Coast. So I did my undergraduate there and then I did my honours. And um, because not many people are in the field of cyber psychology at the moment, in particular in Australia, it was a bit hard to find someone in that in that area as well. So I had to be like really open-minded to find someone who was also open-minded that we could intersect somewhere where what we both were interested in was important. So that's one thing that I'd suggest for anyone studying is just to be open-minded and uh, learn more from other people and see you know, just interact with people and network with people to see what they're interested in, even if you get on well with them or even if they email within a week. You know, some people I approached were really bad with their emails. So I was like, well, you're way down in the list of the people I want to work with. So um, I would suggest that for honours and then, but you have to be really open-minded because you're not going to necessarily get exactly the area you want to get into. And some of my friends were quite clear with where they wanted to go. So like if you're interested in clinical psychology, that's much easier. But for a few of us who are interested more in the research aspects of it, it's a, it's a bit harder. 
Um, if there's a particular area you wanted to go into, that person who asked me the question, let me know. But the pathways I took, because I'm not interested in clinical psychology, so I just did the undergraduate honours and now I'm doing the PhD because I need a PhD to be a lecturer. Okay. Um, someone from South Africa. Ah, that's cool. I was actually made in... Um, what was it called? Rhodesia. So hello, my parents lived there for quite a while. Um, besides turning off notifications, what has been the best tip that you have used in your own life and social interactions that you would recommend? Um, yeah, I think, um, so last year when I was doing my honours, um, I was getting totally overwhelmed with the amount of stuff I had to do and the stuff I had to learn that maybe we hadn't done before. And um, I just, to one day totally freaked out and was really overwhelmed by it all. And I remembered the things that always help me in my life. And that's going ocean swimming. You might see my background that I've used here today. That's like a lagoon I love to go swimming in and exercise. And that's really important. Um, I've been a vegan for 24 years now, so I'm very aware of like more healthier aspects and um, I make sure that I eat healthily and I exercise and I try to encourage the sociability aspect. So last year when my uni crew, we were all not able to see each other in person, so I made sure that I was like um, organizing team meetings. We had team meetings every Thursday with our crew and some other people who were working on assignments together. So I really encourage you to be the one who makes those social things happen because, you know, most people don't, let's be honest. Um, so an anonymous person, what are my tips for people struggling with where to get their news when mainstream media is increasingly running opinions rather than reporting news? And increasingly, these media organisations and news sources are owned by very few wealthy people that have conflicts of interest. Yeah, actually, if you want a new um, activism topic to work on this year, I suggest you have a look at Mad Effing Witches and they do some great stuff online in regards to anti-Murdoch stuff. And Murdoch in particular in Australia, they own a lot of the newspapers here. I think mo all of the newspapers in Queensland, for example, and UK and the US. So um, definitely try to get away from Murdoch related stuff, but it's really hard. But you can also find people within those uh, those um, papers and those online channels who do write very, very good information. For example, I love an author called Trent Dalton. Um, I love some AFL, Australian Football League writers. And it just is all about finding that stuff. And I think it's nowadays, I think it's just like anything if, to find quality music, to find quality art, to find quality TV series and even quality people you need to just sort through a lot of the dross before you even get to that good stuff. So yeah, you have to make, you have to make a bit of a concerted effort into doing that, to be honest. But for me with news, um, I um, am on a lot of mailing lists. So I get a lot of information from mailing lists and a lot of the stuff I'm interested in is cyber related. So Wired is a good example, um, some cyber, cyber security stuff and some people who do cyber related information but yeah you can find something but also keep in mind um you know there's a few uh places that i follow like from canada the intercept and they're very left wing leaning so you don't want to just always get the stuff that you agree with so just be like really mindful to try and learn new stuff that's maybe not what you agree with but yeah, good luck. It's really hard. <laughs> and then Gareth has asked, what are my thoughts around the pressures of other people to engage with social media? For example, I recall several instances where people wanted me to like their posts online and not doing so made them feel I don't care. Yeah, actually, that's really interesting, Gareth, because I'm not personally on Facebook anymore. I have a... Um, fake profile so I can run my my leash on tell page but I don't have a 
personal profile on there. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made years ago, actually. Um, I think with this, and this is what I learned when I deleted my, my um, personal profile, you realize who your true friends really are. So there's heaps of people that will just like your comments or tell you how great you are or stuff like that. But who are the people that when you need their help or when you need someone to talk to or like discuss something like really big in your life, who are those people you can actually go to? And there's, um, oh, what was the number? There's um, something, I can't remember the, the number now that it's called, but you only ever really have 150 people that you can ever actually be close to. So if you've got more than 150 friends online, they're not actually people that you can give the amount of time and conscious energy and mindful attention to. So that would be my thing. And look, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that because I just don't get guilt tripped into anything. And, um, you know, if I like someone, I, I make the effort with them as a person in our friendship or our relationship. So, and it's not all about me liking all of their posts. So that, my, that discussion, which I had with one of my BFFs recently um, about why she needed someone to follow her channel, so her Instagram she was talking about, and I said, oh, so you just want the validation. So I'd be asking that friend, um, do they just want the validation from you? Because, yeah, lots of people want everyone to see how liked they are online but I think it comes down to maybe having a discussion with them. Look, I'm your real friend and I'll talk to you if you need to. And I, you know, I'll send you great texts about how awesome I think you are, but I'm not really going to be liking your post online. And also on that Facebook thing too, Gareth, like I, um, I don't get invited to a lot of stuff where I get, um, the unupdated information when I get invited to stuff because it's on Facebook. Oh yeah, I forgot you're not on Facebook. So I forgot, I forgot to tell you about my barbecue tomorrow night. Can you come? I'm like, no, I've got other plans. Sorry. Like if you really wanted me to be at your event, you would let me know. Um, so yeah, it's a good, um, it's a good way to filter out some supposed friends, Gareth, I think. And then Agatha has asked about the slides. So, um, I will put them on slide share. If you look up slide share and my name, Lee Chantel, you should get to my um, channel. And there's quite a few of my other presentations and I'll put this one up in the next few days. And maybe Winnie, they might be able to go on the Golden Key social media or something when that's there. Yeah, we will be able to email the slides to you know, all the attendees. Sure. Okay, awesome. That's great. So we'll do that too. <laughs> yeah. Thank cool. you for your questions, everyone. So looks like we've answered all the questions and we're recording this session as well. So everyone can come back and enjoy this multiple times. Um, awesome. And we can't, you know, again, we can't thank you enough, Lee Chantel. Uh, thank you for taking your time with us you know, bringing your expertise today. And everyone, thank you so much for joining and take care and be well. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Winnie. Bye. Oh, looks thank you, everyone. Thank you.